All right, good evening, everyone, and welcome to this regular meeting of the Tiger Dalton School Board. I will call the meeting to order at 6.30 p.m. I did want to let you know that we met prior to this meeting in a work session where we talked about K to play fees and the extracurricular equity fund. Um, so you can kind of look back on that later if you would like to. Um, also, before we begin, we have a couple of birthdays to celebrate. Director Bowman has a birthday today. I know, so we can pass this down. And then Vice Chair Hymas has a birthday on January 29th. So happy birthday. We will not sing, but we will applaud your birth. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well done. Should we be applauding yeah. their mothers for their birthdays? I don't think they did that much work that no. day. Correct. No, I worked really hard <laughs> to be here. Uh, Dr. Ricky Smith, are there any changes to the agenda? There are none, Chair. All right, hearing that, I would entertain a motion to approve the agenda. I move to approve the agenda as presented. Second. Motion was made by Vice Chair Jaimes and seconded by Director Bowman. Is there any discussion on the motion? Hearing none, we'll move to a call vote. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 All opposed? Motion carries unanimously. And with that, we'll move into recognition and good news with Lisa Burton. And you can introduce our special VIPs. Um, Stephanie is here from CFT representing our wellness coordinators tonight, but we will go through and recognize all of them. Um, and so our TTSD wellness coordinators um, are, are chosen um, by their school principal or school teams to represent their school or department. And they receive a very, very small stipend for their time committed to providing wellness activities, resources, and support to the staff in their buildings. And so um, I'm gonna go through so we can recognize each of our um, coordinators in our buildings. And on each slide will be a little bit of what that has been happening this school year in their buildings. Um, here we go. And so for Alberta writer, Sarah Tai and Cami Berkowitz, and they plan all kinds of activities and they send out, a, each school sends out, each school or build or department sends out a survey to their staff asking what activities they would like to um, participate in for the school year. And so um, there's quite a variety. <laughs> Byram, Elementary, Byram Elementary, Gina Conrad, and they went roller skating with their staff. And then a lot of, a lot of um, coordinators will use some of their funds to update their staff lounges. Uh, Bridgeport Elementary, Cat Stone. <laughs> I don't know how they get them to um, put, you know, get um, Dorian to do that, but some of them make their photos fun. And then Stephanie, who's here with me this evening, um, would you like to share anything specific about this year for CFT that was most memorable so far? Well, we did the Great CFT Bake Off, which was a take on the Great British Baking Show, um, <laughs> where we had everyone bake something or anyone that wanted to participate. And, um, and so then there were prizes based on presentation and also flavor. Um, and so people could come in throughout the uh, work day and get a nice little treat. So that was one of our favorites and really fun and kind of a riff on the great British, British Bake Off. Um, so yeah, we had a good time with that. And our staff is very big into the potluck. So everyone likes to participate in the potluck. So those are big in our, in our world. And, um, and it seems to bring our staff kind of together, which is nice. Yeah, most of our schools and their surveys have said that really just having time to socialize that's not always outside of school hours because they have other family commitments is really important. So when they can find opportunities to bring staff together, um, that's what they're finding is most popular. Uh, Molly Hag at Durham Elementary, they did a painting class 
which was really fun. And most schools do have walking groups. Um, and then they'll do, they did a smoothie bar, Aaron Reed at Deer Creek Elementary. Um, they have lots of challenges all year long that they win prizes for, which is really fun. Mary Woodward, Daniel Nimey. Um, another competition, they, a lot of schools, what they find from, what they hear from staff as well is that providing healthy snacks that they can drop, pop into the health, into the staff lounge and pick up a snack when they maybe forgot to eat breakfast or bring a lunch. Metzger Elementary, Danielle Marino. And I just want to say that we have a very big mix of teaching teachers and classified staff that are, um, that are providing the support to um, their buildings. And that's, that's pretty cool to see because teachers are pretty busy. So by adding another thing on top and our support staff are also, you know, have a lot of other uh, commitments. Templeton Elementary, Deanne Alba, Al Alba and Isabel Arce, I think is how, um, Isabel is actually at the, um, Early Learning Center. She's the, the secretary, head secretary there. And so she supports the Early Learning Center staff. Tualatin Elementary. Um, and I just wanna share Tualatin Elementary um, applied for and received additional grant funds through Kaiser Permanente. And they were able to remodel their staff lounge or add um, some updates to their staff lounge. And then they were actually able to create a meditation space in a break room, like this little tiny room that looks big in these photos, but it's just a really great space where they can go in and take a break, which is really important on those tough days. And then here's just a couple other photos of their updated staff lounge and an outdoor area that, that is adjacent to their staff lounge where they can go outside and also eat, which staff have just found to be just so amazing um, to have a space um, that's more welcoming to come together. Fowler Middle School, we have um, two brand new coordinators this year, Mandy Apple and, and Hannah Corsole. Hazelbrook Middle School, um, Jody Knight and Jennifer Fiorito, they put together a spinning class, which the dark photo is pretty cool. They had all the lights and everything, but offered um, that class for their staff. Tuality Middle School, Dylan McCann, another goofy guy. Um, they bought a massage chair, and this is just another break space for staff to take a break when they, when you really need a break, and they went paddleboarding this summer. Tigard High School, Vidiana Morales and um, Najwa Swalem, Swalem, if I'm pronouncing that correctly, they also received the Kaiser Grant and were able to update their staff lounge with those funds and create an outdoor space for their staff. Fulton High School, Jessica Buckle and Deanne, Diane Liebrich. And Diane is actually, along with um, some of fellow staff members have created a bunch of videos. I'm not gonna play this, but you all could go back and watch it if you'd like. Planking, arm exercises, stretching um, for their staff to take a break and um, get moving during the day. Uh, Virtual Academy, Coco. Flores and Emily Stuckey. And they're gonna be doing a class coming up they shared with me. Uh, Hibbert offices, Christy Rivas and Fabian Fitzwater have created a workout um, space in our, um, in our um, warehouse. And then they've also brought in a coffee cart for staff. Um, I think it was right before the holidays. And then our departments, nutrition services um, manager, Kim Lung is um, in charge of wellness for her staff. Transportation department, Jean Devonport, she took their funds and created this really amazing outdoor space for drivers to take breaks when it's good weather. And then they have a basketball hoop they installed for, for them to take a break and get some exercise. And then Danny Gavazza with our operations department. Um, they you know, created opportunity for socializing and then sent out some wellness, wellness kits to their staff. Um, including in the slide deck, if you go back, you can see um, our slide deck from our coordinator meeting, which has kind of how the plans for the year and then also more images from those Kaiser grants. So 
anyway, just want to celebrate these staff members who throughout the year are working really hard to support support the staff in their buildings. And um, this is the last year of our, our grant through OEHOS Trust. We have funds through the district and we're um, just hoping we'll continue to have those and be able to continue to support staff. Thank you so much for that presentation and all the work that those wellness coordinators do. Um, before I have any final comments, would my colleagues like to say any words? I was going to say thank you. And um, as a former reluctant participant of um, <laughs> my building at Bridgeport, I um, want to thank you all because I know that uh, the wellness coordinators there at Bridgeport worked really hard to get us all to participate. They created bingo cards and things like that. And um, I just was one of those guys, you know, introverted and uh, really not wanted to participate socially, but that's okay. But thank you all. Dr. Bowman? I think I'm going to say that. So this is the last year of the grant. For, for the OEA Choice Grant, yeah, we had a five-year grant. We had some funds that rolled over into, this is our sixth year, and those funded our wellness coordinator positions. The district has been very generous to um, provide additional funding, which um, provided funds to the schools to um, fund activities. And so we just have to look at look at how we can spread those funds and continue with our coordinators or look at what, what people would prefer. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you for your work. Yeah. I would just echo my thanks for all of your hard work. It's, you know, working in schools with kiddos is hard work. And um, so having an opportunity to blow off a little steam and, and get to know your colleagues a little better, as well as staying healthier, all really important stuff to keep the, the mental juices still flowing and, the, and the, the heart still being there for the job. So thank you very much for all you do to, to keep that going. And I would just echo the, the thanks that my colleagues have said. And I think that you know what you as coordinators do are things that outside of those school buildings, the broader community, it doesn't really know doesn't have that awareness of what's going on and that's extra work and extra preparation. And there's a lot that goes into those activities and getting everybody together and sort of building those relationships. So people want to participate in those things, even if they're reluctant. <laughs> um, and so it's nice for, I think, the broader community to hear that that's happening. And I think that makes a huge difference. And as a teacher, I know that those opportunities really, they matter. And so it's great that you guys are willing to kind of take on that extra load to do that and I maybe offline I'm going to ask who won the bake-off because now I'm very curious but I don't want to it was it was very fun um let's see the banana cake won the taste off okay. um, and that was Diane Shiman Shiman uh-huh and then the this one was a little strange the um presentation was a ashtray but it was pretzels dipped in white chocolate <laughs> and then with cookie like crumbles around so that was yeah i know it was a little hard to give that as an award but i mean it was very creative so you yes. know and and it's all voted on by our staff so i have to go with majority rule yeah. so that's um, wonderful yeah so thank you thank you so much <laughs> all right and with that we will move into our student reports whoever'd like to go first I'll go first. Um, this week, Tiger to High is having their winter festival, which is Friday, and it will be a bunch of events hosted by the students, some which include a cakewalk. And then, of course, the next day on a Saturday, we are having our winter formal dance. And to celebrate those events, we are having a spirit week. And tomorrow's event is color flash for each class wears a color. So if you're a junior, wear green. Um, we also had a successful blood drive last Monday. And we were able to donate 26 pints of blood, which can save up to 111 lives. Um, adding on to that, students are preparing for finals week or um, a lot of students are pretty stressed about this time, but we're you know managing stress levels. I know the PAW is kind of like working on sending out um, like stress management techniques and 
yeah, I know that that's kind of like the main thing for a lot of students right now. Nothing. Um, at 12, we a lot go on. Start with the canned food drive. Um, it ended, I think, sometime last month, but we were able to raise over $1,000 for the and Food Pantry and donate over 650 cans of food, which is 500 more than last year. That was pretty amazing. Um, we had our winter formal dance, which was on Friday of last week. It went pretty smoothly with a lot of positive feedback from students, and it was really an event for underclassmen to get associated with dances, as it was, this is the second to last dance of their school year this year, which is pretty fun for all of them. And on, on the eve of finals week coming up, we have an ASP mental health initiative, which is spearheaded by President Amanda Franza, which like we're opening our student account for our Instagram account for students to DM us so they can have any questions or need any help, they can talk to us. Um, just letting people know that we're here for them. And we're also having lots of resources available during finals week, such as like open study sessions and an affirmation wall where students can take positive notes with them throughout their day. And are handing out mints as encouragements throughout the week, which is yeah, pretty cool. I mean, that was pretty funny, and we would help students. And then outside the school, we've had our spring play announced, the Little Shop of Horrors, and I think the play times are like sometime in early mid March, which I would definitely try to make it out to. And in terms of athletics, our boys basketball is ranked number two in the state, and our girls number five. Um, only four losses I share between those two teams over twenty nine total competitions, which is pretty outstanding. Um, our cheerleading team has a got a win in a competition in Newburgh, and they recently were approved for a national bid to go to Disney World for a nationals this year, which is pretty amazing. And um, our dance swim team and wrestling have all had good starts this season as well and have respective wins or placing in their sports. Wonderful. Thank you so much. And moving on to superintendent and board communications, Dr. Ricky Smith. Thank you so much, Chair. Uh, this evening, I'm pleased to share with the community that the Teachers Association and the district reached a tentative two-year contract agreement early Saturday morning, January 21st. Should the membership vote to ratify the contract, we will bring the contract for board approval at the February 6th meeting. We look forward to continuing our negotiation with our district's classified association on February 3rd. I also wish to extend congratulations and gratitude to the Foundation for Tiger Tualatin Schools Executive Director Margie Green, her staff, and the um, FTTS Board for an outstanding fundraising gala held Saturday evening, attended by TTSD staff and community, including King City Mayor Jamie Fender. The Foundation has long been a critical source of funding for the provision of quality experiences that engage students in their, their school community. And I look forward to preparing a four course dinner, which was my auction donation and thank the board for your auction basket donation as well. And finally, I had the opportunity to testify before the Oregon Senate Education Committee on Tuesday, January 17th, regarding the district's use of federal ESSER funds. Two Senate committee members, Senator Gelsner Bluen and committee chair Senator Dembro expressed their desire to visit our district and learn more about our district's inclusion model for students with disabilities and the district's academic return on investment budget process. Thank you. Director Bowman. Uh, I will, so we're about to enter uh, school board campaign season and school board potential candidates will often ask how much time does it take? The last couple of weeks have been the high end of that with, we're doing all these public interviews with school board members. Uh, and then what time did we leave the district office on Friday? 12.30 a.m. 12.30 in the morning after having done the Friday evening interviews. Um, so I, I, and I was un honestly not at most of this. I just wanted to give a thanks to our district's negotiations team uh, and the TTA negotiations team, both of which put in, this was a, this was a challenging negotiation. I think both sides would, uh, would agree to that, um, but having it resolved feels really good. And I'm really proud of where we ended up. I think it's a fair contract. Um, and I'm just grateful for, I mean, literal, hours and hours, dozens and dozens of hours that people put in to, to get us here. So just wanted to give a shout out to those leaders who stepped up. Um, yes, I want to echo that as well. Um, thank you so much for all of the uh, leaders that stepped up and um, came together and finally um, reached an agreement. I think it's going to be something that it's going to benefit all of us. And um, and so thank you so much for, you know, Chair, for being there for all the time and Superintendent and Cabinet and TTPA for uh, just 
all of those hours of hard work that you all put into um, into it and, and the process, right? And um, just tomorrow, I'm going over to Lincoln City so I can go to the OACOA, which stands for Oregon Association of Central Office Administrators. Um, conference and I'll be there doing some professional development for myself and hopefully translates into more professional development for my board work here as well. And uh, February 4th, we'll be sitting down with um, other board members in Washington County and hopefully advocating for full school funding. Um, I would I would echo all that's been said about the contract negotiations. I've been through a few of those over the years, and they are sometimes a lot of work. And this one was a lot of work. And so thank you to everybody on both sides for all of your hard work in this. Um, it's also been a, a busy week for, th for the board um, with the integrated planning meetings. We had two of them. Um, in the last week, one with middle schools, one with elementary schools. Again, very well attended. It was really amazing how many members of our community and students came out to share their opinions on what was working and what isn't working in the district. Some really great conversations were had. Um, and then finally, um, just thank you to our uh, Tigard High School students. Uh, Chair uh, Urban and I met with our school board reps uh, last week to have lunch and had a really fruitful conversation there about what's what's going on in our high school. So yeah, it's been a busy couple of weeks for board members for sure. Thank you. I think everyone covered at least most of what I was going to say. Um, again, expressing just a lot of, I think, gratitude and also a sort of sigh of relief. Um, with all the leaders that came to the table, both sides of the table for the bargaining. And um, thank you to TTEA and again, district personnel and cabinet for all of their kind of dedication to that process. Um, the lunch with students is wonderful. It always is. And there were some really great conversations that were had um, about the, not only what's going on in the high school and just sort of like this, this school board process that we're kind of in the midst of right now. Um, continued the integrated guidance as Director Zershmi mentioned with those meetings, which are incredibly well attended. And I'm always sort of blown away by just the amount. I mean, this room is filled um, with folks that are just really into like getting down and dirty in the data and looking at it and what does it mean and where can we do better? So it's really great to be a part of that. Um, we continue our interview process for a vacant board seat with our final night of interviews this Thursday, the 26th. And then, um, I was lucky enough to be able to attend the governor's inaugural ball. Um, and we had with Director Bowman and we had quite a Tiger delegation um, there representing, which was wonderful. So got to talk um, with several folks about our school state fund budget um, and just had kind of a, a lovely time. And so that was, I'm really thankful that I had the opportunity to go. That reminded me of something. Uh, so. Today is my birthday, and I think you all would appreciate this considering the work that the district has done on this. Uh, for the cake that they got me for a surprise party, it's on top of the cake, you probably can't see, it's a road going across the cake and it says, Hall for All on the cake. So the word is spreading that Tiger cares a lot about Hall Boulevard, which Hall we Boulevard. talked to everyone. Yes, we did, about. yep. Um, yep, school, school board matters and Hall Boulevard were definitely the top two. So that is, um, all I have. And let's see, Patty, I'm looking at our list and confirming we have no public comments. All right, then with that, we'll move to our first item on reports and discussion, which is the demographer's report with Director Moore. Good evening, Chair Irvin and members of the board. Uh, this evening, we have uh, Charles Reinerson with us of Flow Analytics, and they have prepared our uh, updated 10-year enrollment forecast beginning with next year. 
and um, the report uh, can be found in the link on page 50 of the, the board report under supplementary materials and Charles is prepared to uh, orient you to the report as it is it is a new format um, this year under flow and um, provide some of the highlights related to the enrollment forecast and with that I'll turn it over to Charles. Thank you and thank you Chair Irvin and the board and Superintendent Ricky Smith. Uh, as uh, David mentioned it's a new format some different things, but hopefully uh, some, some extras that you'll appreciate. We're, Flow is uh, largely a GIS firm, so we've got a couple of nice maps to start off the report, including that density map, figure two, showing uh, spots of, of denser student populations uh, around the district and with some notable gaps in some industrial areas and in the southwest uh, part of the district where we expect to see more growth in, in the future. And I, before it got dark, I drove out to River Terrace. I hadn't been out there for a while, but what I saw confirmed the, the data that I had gathered for this report. There's a lot of houses under construction there. So we, I like to include population data, figure three, uh, showing population by city within the district. So that indentation represents all those cities, of course, Durham and King City entirely in the district and Tiger mostly in the district and Tualatin mostly in the district. The, like many districts outside of incorporated areas, the, the share of population is, is uh, shrinking. You know, the most, more of the district is within incorporated areas in 2020 than it was in, in 2000. And Tigard and Tualatin have both grown pretty close to uh, maintaining their share of district total population. However, however figure four tells a different story. Uh, there was, in the first decade of this century, there was growth in the child population under 18. Unfortunately, the Census Bureau is taking a long time to release the detail from the 2020 census. We don't have the the single year of age data that we like to use to, to evaluate capture rates for school districts, but they did publish the, the total population and 18 and over population, which tells us that the under 18 population actually shrank within the, the district in spite of uh, that more than 11,000 growth in total population. There the uh, a few hundred fewer children than there were in 2010. And that, uh, given what we'll see a little later with births, that's expected to continue. Uh, figure five, student generation rates also usually draws a lot of interest. We looked at all the new housing built between 2014 and, and 26, 21 and compared it to the locations, uh, home addresses of students K-12 in fall of 22, and found an average of just 0.32 K-12 students per single family home. And most people expect it to be higher than that. See all these houses popping up and figure there's one or two school-aged children in, in each house, but it's not really the case. It varies quite a bit though. Uh, we, we measured the new homes in River Terrace, an average of 0.44 K-12 students in those homes that had been built by 2021. The attached uh, single family though, much lower, uh, somewhere between a third and a quarter of as many students as, as each uh, detached home. Multifamily very, varies tremendously the big difference between market rate housing and income restricted housing, the, it, the real uh, higher rates come from income restricted two, three and four bedroom units. Is that at least one new development in, in the, the district built in the last few years that is closer to 0.7. 
So seven tiger dwelling students in every 10 units, whereas the market rate housing, uh, only about one student per 11 units. We include one more nice map, uh, figure six, showing upcoming development, both uh, planned, maybe some not so near future, like the redevelopment of Washington Square area and others that are already underway. And, and they are listed in figure seven uh, with a bit of uh, information about the status and timeline. And by the way, we'll, we'll, I'll breeze through these. And if you have questions at the end, uh, I'll take as much time as you'd like. Uh, but we compiled the historic enrollment by grade and by school. Uh, as you all know, uh, there were small losses leading up to 2019, but big losses during the COVID year and relatively stable since then. Uh, And a few uh, figures on transfer rates, you know, the, the re residing attendant matrix, and of course, your, uh, the way immersion programs attract students from across the district. So you can see in, in those tables for the elementary schools, we've, uh, since, since they're reported separately in your enrollment reports, we've forecast them separately and also tabulated of where people live versus where they're going to school by geocoding the uh, student information system records. Uh, moving on to figure 14, this is the really uh, interesting one for forecasts, uh, births and kindergarten enrollment. The number of births, uh, well, it peaked before the data shown in this table, but I believe like most places around Oregon and the US, the uh, births peaked in about 2007, but they, they had started to stabilize and then dropped off after about 2016. So uh, 2020 and, 20, and 2021, really fewer births than, than for many years before. And that will affect in upcoming kindergarten classes in, in some way. And the way that we've uh, modeled it is not to expect that that ratio of kindergarten to births five years earlier. And, and by the way, those are lined up vertically. So you can see the current school year 2022, 717 kindergarten students residing within the district. This is not counting additional students who are transferring into the district. 717 kindergarten students residing in the district compared with 1,009 births to residents of the district five years earlier. So that's a ratio of 0.71. And it had been earlier uh, in the last decade as high as you know, 0 0.88, 0 0.89. It dropped to 0.64. Uh, during the first year of the pandemic and has recovered a bit. We continue uh, to assume a recovery, but sort of a, a midpoint between where it is now and where it has been in the past. So gradually increasing to 0 0.83 by 2025. Even with that increase, the kindergarten forecast doesn't recover to where we were pre COVID. The grade progression rates is the other key input to the model. And we were fortunate to be able to look at three years of, of grade progression before COVID. So that kindergarten, that K-1 rate, generally above one, means that there's always more first graders net growth each year from this year's first grade to last year's kindergarten. So where you see figures below 1.00, that's where there's a net loss in the cohort, such as uh, between 
So if we look at the, the 2022 column, this current year, you had fewer third graders this year than second graders the, the year before. And these cohort rates are really more important to forecasters than the total enrollment. You might wanna look at the K-12 total and see whether it's gone up or down, but really what's important is the cohort growth and the incoming kindergarten. So we're assuming the pre-COVID average, but with the lower base and the forecasts are generally reflect a slightly higher grade progression rate than what we saw uh, the last few years and perhaps even pre-COVID. So as I mentioned, the, the ratio to births is very important and therefore we have a district-wide low and high scenario that models different births in figure 16. I mean, diff same number of births, different ratio of, of kindergarten to births. So if, if there were no recovery from our recent uh, ratio in the low 0.7s to mid 0.7s, you'd see the top line uh, kindergarten would not recover to 800 students. The middle forecast is the one that you saw already and the high forecast is very bullish. It would reflect lots of new housing, lots of in-migration and uh, back to, to maybe the boom years of the, before the housing uh, crisis. And those K-12 uh, forecasts that result from all that are shown in figure 17, high, middle and low. The, the K-12 total in the middle forecast is pretty stable, uh, falling in the high, falling in the low forecast and increasing slightly in the high forecast. Uh, detail by individual grade is in following tables and as well as by individual school. And we, we did model uh, the new school, Art Rutkin and we got the boundary for that in our uh, geographic information system to be able to forecast the, the number of students uh, coming from the existing and, and new homes in that area. Generally, we've got, we're showing enrollment uh, growth at the elementary level, especially in the last five years of the forecast. We've also, built in some assumption about growth in the Deer Creek area after 2027 from Kingston Terrace. Uh, the first housing built there might be a lot of multifamily. We don't know if there's an affordable component yet, but, but if, uh, if we're continuing to work on the forecast, we'll continue to look at that and update the, the assumptions as more information comes in. And that's, uh, those are the highlights. I'd love to hear any thoughts or discussion or questions if you have them. Anyone wanna start? That's a lot of information. So I might need I'd, a minute. I'd be happy to start. Go ahead. Uh, Charles, thank you so much. This report of yours is one of my favorite parts of being on the school board. I find this stuff absolutely fascinating. And I, I love the new format and the, the graphs in particular, the maps um, are really, really nice. The, the ability to follow each grade level cohort is much more explicit in this than I've seen it in years past. So thank you for that very much. Um, I wanted to ask you a question regarding figure five, and now I am scrolling like mad to get back to figure five, and of course I can't find it. <laughs> so hang on just a second. Um, yeah, so in the student generation rates for single family versus multifamily, am I correct in my memory that not that long ago, we were seeing about 0.5 of a student for every single family. So this is down considerably in the last 10 years. That's right. That's right. And, and of course, this is new housing. You know, we do that in part because, uh, 
well, you want to anticipate the new, the next round of new housing. So, and generally the newest housing has more elementary students in it. We've, we've shown that before. Uh, we also do this, we also do, my, the firm that I've gone to work for does a lot of work in the state of Washington and they have some statutory requirements for how to measure this uh, for their uh, facilities program, statewide facilities program. So they, in order to charge systems development charges, they have to have these, these uh, rates. And so, yeah, I don't think we're gonna find much higher rates though if we used, looked at all existing housing. There are fewer and fewer households that have children these days. And this, the, the brand new housing, you know, a lot of it is uh, uh, very expensive on very small lots. So not necessarily a, a lot of children in it. I find it fascinating and also horrifying at the same time that the income restricted apartments are where we're getting our biggest uh, percentage of students per unit. Um, that speaks volumes to how much families are struggling right now to make rent and have kids at the same time. Yeah, the new, new market rate housing is very expensive. And not always a lot of uh, large units. Director Bellman? Um, I'll echo Director Zershmi's thanks for all your work on this. This is fascinating information and sort of hard to wrap your mind around. Um, I'm curious, so the governor is talking about massively expanding um, housing production in the state. Um, and obviously we have some challenges in this uh, community in terms of available land to build, but I'm wondering if your projections account for, you know, potential changes to the urban growth boundary or um, dramatic increase in production in housing production that may potentially happen or how you think that could impact us here potentially. Well, I know there's a river terrace 2.0 uh, on the books, uh, speaking of urban growth boundary expansion, that's not factored into this yet. Uh, and it'll be really interesting to see as those houses fill up in River Terrace 1.0. <laughs> uh, you know, is there going to be any difference in in the number of students? As you know, there's a brand new school there, and more of a a community. You know, is that going to make a difference? So, uh, I'm not sure about how. You know the interest rates and and the market and the economy. I think have a lot more to do with housing production than than public policy. But uh, yeah. we'll see. Is is River Terrace two point oh exclusively TTSD, or is there Beaverton? Does anyone know? I want to say that there are there is a sec segment that the, the way that the boundary cuts in, in Tiger that goes over to be but the preponderance of that development is within TTSD within within district boundaries. That'll be interesting to track. Thank you again. I have a follow up question on the um, the student generation rates. Are these rates similar to what you're seeing for other school districts and? Also, if you're doing work in Washington districts in other states. Well, uh, my colleague just finished a report for North Clackamas that I reviewed, and it was a lot higher. The, I think the single family rate was closer to 0. 0.6, like double this. A lot, of, a lot of new housing in Happy Valley that's got a lot of kids in it. Uh, we, we, we've worked in some other communities, not suburban communities, but uh, I worked in, on a project in Ashland, which is a very expensive community and lots of students and lots of people without families. It's, uh, it was more like 0.2, same in, in Bremerton where I just worked. And of course, urban districts are very low to Portland, Seattle. My next project is San Francisco Unified. So I know there, there are not, there's a lot of new housing there, but not a lot of growth in the child population. So it's directly correlated to the, the expense of housing. Yeah, that's a big factor. 
expensive housing. Uh, yeah, there's there's a lot of factors, but in general, ev most everywhere it's lower than it was uh, relative to five, six, seven years ago. That was one of my questions. Um, another question, so, and this isn't probably, this might be more of an opinion, but four or five years ago when River Terrace 1.0 was in the works, um, I mean, is this surprising that as we've added all this housing that those numbers aren't maybe increasing the way perhaps that they were? I mean, that, that would be my hypothesis was if we looked at the forecasting rates four or five years ago, we would have thought this would have had a lot more kiddos in this sort of mm -hmm. big development. Is that? Yeah. And I was working on the, <laughs> on the Tiger Tualatin forecast actually for many years. And I, I measured what I thought were comparable developments to, to River Terrace, just in terms of the size of homes and lots and developed some rates that we expected. Uh, and they were higher than, than what we're seeing so far. Yeah. And I'm sure that the, you know, having a pandemic smack dab in the middle really sort of derailed potential families moving into those as well. My other question, and then I'll, if any other um, directors have questions, but when we look at figure 21 and the enrollment forecast by school, as we add Art Rutkin, and I'm seeing that for the most part, the other schools decrease slightly, is that 153 that we're adding in partially taking current students that would be at Alberta Rider or Deer Creek and moving them? Like, is there a deficit in those schools because we're adding them to Art Rutkin as well as a few losses of students overall? But is that part of that, that Art Rutkin number? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, there, there's some students that might have been at Alberta Rider, as well as students that are coming from new developments. Okay, just wanted to clarify that. Any other questions, comments? Well, thank you, Director Moore. Thank you, Charles, for this um, comprehensive report. And I think to Director Zershmi's point, this is so much information. It's really fascinating to probably have all this take a deeper dive and probably come up with several more questions after we take a look. So thank you so much. Thank you. And with that, I have to scroll. Oh, there we go. All right. And we have our second report and discussion item, which is the Mitch Charter School annual presentation. Director Robson and friends. All right. Board Chair Irvin, members of the board, good to see everybody. Uh, this evening, I have the pleasure of introducing um, some special guests and partners in uh, the world of education from Mitch. Uh, this is um, Caitlin Blood, who is the acting interim um, director of Mitch uh, currently. Uh, but before, well, actually, and I want to see if I get this right, Caitlin. Um, um, in 2015, you've been a member of the Mitch Learning Community for a while, in 2015, acting as a member of the board, I believe. And then prior to becoming the interim director of Mitch, uh, Caitlin was a staff member at Mitch as well. So she's been around the Mitch Learning Community for a while. And so happy to have you this evening, every year, uh, as a part of um, our relationship and Mitch contract, uh, uh, the interim director and um, guests uh, 
uh, come to an annual board meeting uh, and give a report as to um, what's going on at Mitch and kind of an update and uh, offer up opportunities for the board to ask questions as well. So with that, I wanna turn it over to Caitlin and say welcome. Yeah. Thanks for having us tonight. Um, my name is Caitlin Blunt, and this is my friend and a parent at Mitch Charter School and someone you might recognize who's been around TTSD for a little while doing good equity work in the district, Men Fierte. Um, he's going to speak a little bit at the end about his experience at Mitch. He has two kids at Mitch and has been really active member in our community and we're really lucky to have our fam their family with us. Um, I'm wondering how far away, nope, okay. Oh, all right, cool. I'm wondering, are my slides available? Oh, you are, Patty? Okay, thank you very much. Oh, no way, technical difficulties, we love those. Okay, well, I'll just get started. Um, we have had a big administrative shift at Mitch this year and want to start by saying how grateful we are to all of the folks at TTSD for supporting us through this transition. I know we can say from experience that TTSD truly goes above and beyond for every student every day. So thank you. Um, when the slides show up, you'll be looking at a photo of our students at one of their three annual field trips to our table cooperative which is a local community owned and biodynamic farm that our students visit to learn about environmentally and socially responsible agriculture agriculture is a core piece of the educational experience at mitch and a vital component that teaches our students to be critical thinkers question dominant norms and look for equitable solutions um, we've got a slide with the agenda on it, but I'm just going to keep on cruising through. See it on our left. Oh, you can. Oh, that's great. All right. Well, our agenda tonight is going to be framed by our strategic plan, the elements that shape our equity statement. Um, and in two, let's see, in 2022, we updated our strategic plan. If you forward to slide three. We updated our strategic plan, which informs our continual improvement plan. Um, our updated mission statement reads that we believe that the strength of our community lies in its diversity. We know the power of having many different voices at the table. These voices resound from the hearts and minds of our youth who hold the keys to a just, fair, and sustainable future. Therefore, we strive to equitably serve each student honoring their identity and academic journey. In partnership with our community, we cultivate a school-wide culture of belonging in which all students are empowered to become literate, knowledgeable, and confident leaders serving our community, nation, and world. So the way that we work toward this mission is most visible in our curriculum, which is content-oriented and centers social-emotional learning, student identity, diverse perspectives, and hands-on learning. On slide four, our strategic plan is driven by three pillars of equity, the first one being access, to ensure that racially, culturally, and socioeconomically diverse students have equitable access to excellent education, teachers, and leaders who are impactful and empowering. So to measure the accessibility at Mitch and in accordance with our charter contract, we pay close attention to our student and teacher demographics. Our goal is to develop a demographic that more closely matches TTSD and our neighboring schools, because that's one of the ways that we'll know that we're adequately serving our community. Though we have a diverse population at Mitch, as you can see by our demographics and our list of home languages, our biggest gap between TTSD and Mitch is in our Latinx population. Our BIPOC community has grown overall since our charter renewal in 2018, and we've seen the biggest growth in our multiracial population. In order to create an environment that's accessible, particularly to our local Latinx community, we are translating our school outreach, our surveys, literature, and weekly newsletters into other languages, primarily Spanish. As for transportation, the majority of our families get to school by car, 
but we have almost 50 students that ride the bus. So thank you for that bus, because that's been a really big piece of our charter contract that has a, had a great impact on our community. School lunch is an accessibility issue for us as we do not have a cafeteria and do not currently qualify for the free and reduced lunch program, but we are seeking solutions and do provide snacks in our front office. Our school counselor and our PSO strive for equity by regularly reaching out to families to gauge needs and provide clothing, food, and gift support for families. Our ELL or multilingual learners are about 9% of our population. We use the sheltered instruction methods in our literacy program. And we are working closely with the ELD team at TTSD to implement testing and supplemental literacy instruction. Our SPED students are about 12% of our population. We work closely with Carol Kinch. Thank you, Carol. And we are so grateful for her support. TTSD provides us with one learning specialist and one learning specialist assistant who work tireless, tirelessly to support our classroom teachers and SPED students. On slide five, our enrollment um, was steadily increasing and then jumped to almost 250 students this year. We found with our current classroom structure that this is a healthy number for our community. It really allows us to have small class sizes, which you can see below. Um, in K-1, we are between 16 to 18 students in a class. Um, in two through four, we're around 20 to 23, I think is our max. Oh, thank you, Patty. Yeah, 22. And then in fifth grade, we have a co-teaching arrangement. Um, so we have about 29 students in fifth grade currently. On to slide six. Next slide, please. Thank you for pulling these up. So our second pillar of equity that drives our strategic plan is inclusion, which reads involvement and empowerment, where the fundamental value and dignity of all people are honored. Mitch develops and maintains a sense of belonging and practices respect for the talents, abilities, backgrounds, and lifestyles of its families. So we're engaging surface level cultural shifts through school messaging and literature, as well as incorporating our many home languages into artistic and aesthetic messaging throughout the school and in our curriculum. But on a deeper cultural level, level we're reaching out to BIPOC communities to attract a more diverse school staff that reflects and affirms our student body. Under the guidance of TTSD's Director of Equity, Zinia Un, and former trauma-informed schools coordinator, Alfonso Ramirez, we have put much of our energy toward engaging monthly professional development to grow our staff's culturally responsive practices and asset-based thinking. Currently, Jennifer Whitman's, our fifth grade teacher, is leading this effort. On slide seven, next slide, please. Thank you. Our curriculum is a vital component of inclusion at Niche. Um, so I'm just going to give you a quick walkthrough of how it is woven together in a way that centers student identity, empowers traditionally underserved voices, and promotes critical thinking. Um, Dr. Sue, if you don't mind passing down those little workbooks, those are some examples of our agriculture program materials, which teaches students to return or rematriate Indigenous seeds to their original owners, and it's woven throughout our core knowledge curriculum. So the foundation of our curriculum is core knowledge. It has a robust history and science curriculum, which includes subjects like astronomy, Native American civilizations, geology, and Mesoamerican civilizations. This connects really well with our ag program, our agriculture program, which partners with various indigenous peoples around the country, as well as the great body shop curriculum since core knowledge also addresses different body systems in more depth. Our SEL curriculum provides opportunities for student agency, empowerment, and a sense of belonging, while our collaborative classroom curriculum allows our students to experience diverse reading materials and incorporate them into our writing units. And finally, our math curriculum ascribes to a similar method, and it teaches students the why behind the numbers through a storytelling narrative. Next slide, please.
Awesome, thank you. So opportunity is the final pillar of equity at Mitch. As of last year, our students were performing above the state average. Based on information gathered from our community, we believe that this is due to our small class sizes, our small reading group support, um, whole, our whole child focus, and the content-oriented hands-on curriculum. Our school counselor, two instructional assistants, and a part-time reading specialist are all vital to our school's ability to support all students in their learning journey. And they are funded by the SIA and ESSER grants. A big thanks goes to David Moore and Raymond Grossenbach for their support in bringing those funds and services to our students. Oh, thank you, David. Next slide, please. Awesome. So as I mentioned, we're actively looking for solutions to our lunch program at Mitch. Um, making sure that those basic needs are met before students are ready to learn is vital. Our focus since coming back from the pandemic has been to provide for our families, but we are very excited about building partnerships within our community and with local nonprofits and businesses beyond. Finally, we've been working with Timothy Gross, the Associate Director of Student Services, to develop a more robust PBIS program to align with the district and support student behavior. I think that's really going to set our students up well for joining um, the district when they come back to middle school. So next we're gonna hear from Menfir, who you may know. He is the father of a first grader and a third grader at Mitch, and he has a Tualatin High School graduate. Um, he's been a really engaged voice at Mitch, and he volunteered to share about his students' success at the school. Thank you, Menfir. Can I speak Spanish? You guys understand? You want me, I'm trying to speak English a little bit, you know, but I've got to maybe try to do my best. Okay, well, thank you so much for being inviting me. Um, this for me is a big pleasure to see uh, uh, you guys' faces. Again, uh, I was here, like uh, she said, uh, working with you guys, like maybe like three years ago. So, but it looks like, uh, well, I'll be back. Because I got two kids and Mitch. And uh, I just want to, just, you know, to you guys to let you know that uh, I'm so happy that my kids and Mitch, uh, I'll be honest, you know, at first, you know, because I was a new school, I was not sure, like, you know, of Mitch, you know, I know my neighborhood, you know, different, uh, schools, but uh, basic, you know, um, thank you so much for all the support that you guys do to the school. Uh, they do a good job. My kids, it uh, looks like they, they do very good. So it uh, make me so proud too, because uh, like uh, we working together with like a community, you know, and the school and the parents, you know, they be together, I think. Uh, um, yeah, my kids, uh, they look, uh, they're doing good. I'm so happy to see how my kids, you know, helping another kids. It looks like the, the education is, I'm gonna say better, honestly. You know, I got nieces and I got neighbors, you know, they got kids, sometimes we do a babysitting and, and I'm surprised and my kids finally, you know, they, they helping another kids to do the homework because like my daughter, like she's in the third grade, she knows some stuff like a math, she's doing good. Honestly, she's very good at math. And my little boy, he's he's so excited to go to school every day. You know, he's happy to be social and everything with the teachers and with the principal that we have now. We working last year and like a teacher. Now we got to try to work with the principal to helping. And I say helping like for my community. I'm talking about like Latinos, you know, like I always try to just to, to talk, you know, like helping another kids to finish the school. I'm so happy that my daughter finished school. She graduated. Now she's got, she got two jobs and <clears throat> she's in college. So yeah, I just wanna say, you know, thank you so much for all the support. It looks like the work we do together like the last three years, I remember that we were trying to just split all the funds and everything for every single, you know, um, associations and everything. And now I see it, it looks like it works. It works. Thank you so much. Yeah. Entonces se siente mejor estar ahí en, en Mitch que en las otras escuelas. Pues eh, a mi punto de vista, 
Eh, por lo que veo que mis hijos están pues, acá, académicamente bien, ¿me entiende? No quiero hacer de menos otras escuelas, ¿verdad? Sí. Pero por lo que veo, este, sí está la educación, está un poco más avanzada, la verdad, verdad. Como le dije, y eh, no sé si van a entenderme ahorita, es de que, pues, mis hijos ayudan a otros. Mis hijos ayudan a sus primos a terminar la tarea. ¿Me entiende? Ajá. Ahorita, por ejemplo, mi sobrina está aprendiendo cosas que mi hija ya lo sabía. Ah, ok. En matemáticas, Ajá. mi hija, no sé si lo trae de mí, porque yo soy contador. Yo estudié auditoría en mi país. Oh, okay. Pero ella, para matemáticas, termina el deber en menos de uno o dos minutos. Y uh -huh. yo me sorprendo uh -huh. a veces, ¿me entiende? Uh -huh. Ya sabe las tablas de multiplicar del 11, sabe los números hasta mil, no sé. Uh -huh. Y mi hijo pequeño, como que ella me inspira y también los maestros. Pues la mera verdad, sí. En comparación a la educación que recibió su otra niña, perdón, niña, ¿verdad? Sí. Um, en, en las escuelas de Tiger Trot en, y las que está recibiendo ahorita sus niños en, en Mitch. Entonces le está yendo mejor a sus niños, a su parecer. Pues para serles sincero, ahí sí que vamos a ser sinceros. Al principio... Eh, yo dejo que mi esposa tome la decisión lo que es en la educación. Sí. Yo lo único que hago son firmar los cheques. Es lo único Ajá. que hago. ¿Me entiendes? Y yo trabajo y de todo. Pero sí. al principio dije, no, pues ¿para qué la pasa a cambiar? ¿Me entiendes? Ajá. Pero este, por lo que he visto, el cambio ha sido bastante radical, muy bueno. La okay. verdad. O sea, no tengo nada en contra de Mesker, no tengo nada de, de Fowler ¿Sí? eh, y, no. y, y Tiger High School. Ajá. Por lo que he visto, al menos con mi hija, Tualatin High School, Ajá. She, ella le fue muy bien, la mera verdad, okay. y, y tuvimos una muy buena experiencia. Y como padre, yo estuve involucrado y vi también. Y también, pues, no digo que no, eh, tratamos de colaborar con lo del board y todo, de sí. los cambios que iban a hacerse por lo, las clases y todo, con, trabajando con Fowler y con otras, con eh, Hesselbrock y todo eso. Sí. Me recuerdo las reuniones que estuvimos, pero sí, definitivamente, pues siento que está bien, ¿entiendes? No, pues este, muchas gracias por haber venido y lo invito a que siga viniendo aquí a hablar más en español aquí con nosotros. Ok, pues gracias, la mera verdad, sí, este, ya tenía rato de no haber venido y pues, eh, a veces también por mi trabajo y, y, y pues eh, cuando estuvo con mi hija en el high school fue difícil, pero eh, no me arrepiento, valió la pena en las reuniones que estuve, puedo ver el resultado de mi hija de que a la mera verdad, pues, pues veo que fue muy buena decisión que tomé y voy a tratar la manera de tomar esta decisión de pues tratar de apoyar aquí a la directora en lo que uno pueda para poder salir adelante. Gracias. Gracias. So one of the questions was the difference between, correct, the schools from his daughter that graduated to Alton, sort of like the difference between Mitch and those schools. So, and I cut parts, but I'm slow. Um, so, <laughs> will so, I, but I would like everyone to kind of hear some of those those key differences and and those ideas that that you felt that the image I know, um, and it's okay. But I but I do want to make sure that I catch it all that those between the your daughter's experiences versus your two youngers now at Mitch and sort of what those changes are. And I know a lot of it was. I mean, the classes and the director and the, the teachers and a lot of the help that's provided um, and the, the learning projects, but what, what? Did I? Yeah. No. But I probably missed a lot. So I just wanted to make sure that I understood the, you know, and captured the rest of what you you were saying. Yeah, but, well, I don't, I'm, uh, correct me if I'm maybe wrong. I remember when we was the meeting last time, you know, like three, four years ago. I think we was talking about like, maybe put some uh, extra uh, uh, teacher, like assistant, because that was the number, you know, right? We talking about that other schools, it's like what, 30, 45 kids, you know? In these cases, maybe it's because Mitch only had like 12, 13 or 20 at least, you know? So I think it's the concentrating more attention on the kids, you know? And, and I think, like I said, I remember last time we were talking about like, oh yeah, put some extra, to helping to the teachers because I know they do a good job. You know, I know be teacher is hard, honestly, because I understand, you know, uh, but that's 
basic, I think that's the difference between, I think it's the numbers, you know, because it's not the same, but like, you know, trying to take care of control, like 45 kids, you know, mm -hmm. but they're only 22. So I think maybe that's maybe there may be the difference between, I think, you know, maybe the other schools, maybe get more assistance, maybe, I'm not sure to get it, you know, to get, keep more control and concentrating in the kids, I think, because that's what I see the difference between my nieces and my daughters, you know. Thank you, I appreciate that. Directors, Dr. Bowman. So I just wanna say thanks for coming. I, uh, I remember some of those previous board meetings and I had more critical questions than, than I do now, um, in part because I, it's clear to me that you, uh, and when I say you, I mean institutionally, Mitch uh, has, made some significant changes over the last few years. Um, I think for the better, there's clearly still work to do, which I appreciate you um, calling out and recognizing. Um, but I just, it makes me happy that uh, the relationship between TT, TTSD and Mitch is cooperative and collaborative. Um, I don't like it when there's this framing of like competition where like we're trying to steal the kids and you're trying to get the kids and like that just is not good for kids and families. Um, so it's really excellent hearing from the family perspective of how, uh, you know, different students need different learning environments, different students need different resources. Um, so I think it's great that we have an education ecosystem where different kids can uh, can access what they need. And I did want to shout, raise your hand if you're a Mitch teacher or parent in the audience here this evening. Thank you all for being here uh, and for participating this evening as well. Give me a hand, Director. Can you talk more about your, um, I know one of your core beliefs is inclusion and talk more about your anti-bias training and cultural responsive teaching. I was noticing on your, um, your booklet that you gave us, right? Talking about the Cherokee Trail of Tears and, um, you know, a, a subject that definitely has uh, is, I guess, you know, has a lot of controversy behind it. And so how do you prime your staff to be able to teach that kind of content? So you're looking at our, our workbooks from our agriculture program um, and students get two ag classes, specifically ag classes a quarter. And then we students, every grade gets their own seed that they grow out, they plant, they raise, and then they save and rematriate or return back to their original owners. And so really it's, it's, a, it's been a really iterative um, and explorative process for our community because agriculture um, in a lot, of, a lot of ways is not thought of as a way to empower communities. It's, you're talking about food, right? Um, but food is the basis of our well being in so many ways. And so the history that comes with it and the way that it's grounded in society is something that um, is something that almost everyone can relate to, right? So engaging our students' identities in these discussions around what is food? What is food to you? What are the history of these seeds? Um, where have they traveled? Where have they come from? And now where do they need to go? Who do they really belong to? Um, we get our kids talking about things like food sovereignty. Um, and those are those are topics that we engage in in the classroom. And so when we talk about the Cherokee Trail of Tears, uh, we talk about resilience and we talk about the importance of returning these seeds to their original owners and why it's important for them to have control over these seeds and what it means to have control over these seeds because it's control over culture and narrative. And it brings those voices into the classroom. We do the same with the Macaw Ozet Potato uh, in kindergarten, and we partner with these tribal nations and tribal community members uh, in order to get their voices into our classrooms as well. So, yeah, I, no, I was just wondering. I mean, um, you know, just going over the the text 
in terms of a second grade narrative and um, you know what a how a second grade second grader would be able to understand um, the context in this text and um, I was just wondering how that was uh, how that was primed mm -hmm. in each classroom mm -hmm. you know given the fact that you know, like for instance, here where it says four thousand Cherokees were killed and died along the way, right? Mm -hmm. Like, um, how do we talk about mass genocide mm -hmm. with a second grader? We do. Core knowledge does cover the Cherokee Trail of Tears, so it's something that's covered in our core curriculum. So the agriculture program just builds on the reparative side of that, instead of acknowledging it and moving on, we get our kids involved in doing something about it. Yeah, Director Zershmi. Yeah, I was hoping you could expand upon what you said about your, um, your, your need to develop your lunch program. What have you done so far and what is your plan for the future and what's the timeline look like for that? Because Thank as you, you say, food is really important. Right. <laughs> lunch at school is really important. Right. Um, so over the years, we've had different lunch programs uh, where we've ordered it and brought it in. Actually, we were really grateful for it that we had access to the free and reduced lunch program just through the pandemic. And that was really big for our families. Um, moving forward, we've been looking at grants, largely, um, to bring in food. We don't, we would, in order to install a cafeteria, um, we would need to do a pretty massive capital campaign and overhaul. So right now we're currently looking at grants for programs to order the food and have it delivered to Mitch. And we've done that a few times over the years, but it hasn't been um, funded. Families have bought into the program. Currently we are able to provide students with snacks and then students bring their lunches in um, and then we also support families um, through our school counseling program when we're aware of needs and we've reached out to families to gauge what those needs are. So when you have a student who is um, on free and reduced lunch, how do they get fed? Well, right now we have a relationship between our school counselor and our families that are in need. And so what we do is we either um, connect them with resources and we're also developing a backpack program that should be launching this spring so that's what we've that's another piece that's on the horizon for us okay thank you thank you well oh, did anyone else have any students no all right um well thank you so much i a couple of my questions were answered and I think to um, Vice Chair Jaime's point, I and I, what your kind of explanation was, I love the cross curricular um, building of knowledge. So it sounds like, although you know, there's some, you know, some context here in some of these ag courses, they're already getting that layered in through either core knowledge or the literacy, and so really all of those pieces are just sort of layered upon for understanding. And I love that approach. So, um, and these are wonderful by the way, really wonderful materials. Um, so thank you so much. I don't, my one question was about the lunch program and so you've answered that. And um, thank you so much for presenting and thank you for coming and, and letting us know your experience. I really appreciate that. And thank you, Director Robson. All right, and with that, we will move on to our first and only action item for the night, the TTSD phone system licensing renewal with Mr. Bernard and Director Moore. Good evening, uh, Chair Irvin and Vice Chair Hymans and members of the board. Um, 
we may have been having some internet connectivity issues. So if you are, you can use TTSD guest while we work on the other problems. Um, <laughs> I will recap the um, board memo that I uh, sent to the board. We purchased a phone system with our 2000 and uh, back in 2012 with bond funds. Um, uh, and we have software that goes along with that uh, phone system. Originally, we purchased hardware and software, and over the years, the hardware that we purchased was incorporated into just our regular network equipment. Um, as technology evolves, we didn't need anything special for the phones. So the only thing that's left over now that's specific to phones is this licensing and our handsets and a couple other smaller devices. Um, unfortunately, it's not a small item at $300,000. Um, it gets us five years. Um, a typical phone system, a digital phone system, or even analog takes us about 15 years. So likely we will be, this will be our last renewal and we'll be looking to replace the phone system the next time I come here in five years regarding the phone system. Um, but we'll be doing an evaluation as well before we do that. So um, this evening's ask is uh, to renew um, a licensing for the phone system that we use Cisco phones. Um, for 60 months at the amount of $326,250. All right, any questions? Otherwise, I would entertain a motion. I have one quick question. Yep. So when we had the phone problems at the, at the district office, um, what was that, a couple of weeks ago, is that covered by this kind of a service contract or is that an additional expense on top of? It's an additional expense because it's actually a separate service. This okay. service is actually to run all of our internal phones between schools. That is the service that provides our connection out. So our actual phone service, this is licensing for the phone system itself. Okay. So this right. is what pays for everything <laughs> to work in between the schools. And then we have to yet pay somebody else to get out and call outside of the district. And that's what failed a couple of weeks back. Okay, rats. I was hoping that this was going to clear up that problem. No such. Yes, luck. we are still working on that, and I agree. Not not an ideal situation, and we'll keep troubleshooting that. Thank you. This reminds me of how much I pay AT and T on a monthly basis. Um, <laughs> with that, I move that the board approve purchase of Cisco Flex licensing, sixty months with the. Construction exercise tax fund and authorize the district superintendent or CFO to sign the purchase order to um, Ethnetics in an amount of $326,250. Second. Motion is made by Vice Chair Jaimes and seconded by Director Zershmi. Is there any discussion on the motion? Hearing none, I will move to a vote, call a vote. All those in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? All right, the motion carries unanimously. Thank you. All right, and Patty confirming there are no additional, perfect. All right, so with that, and I did wanna thank again, the teachers and community members and parents that came out tonight to support um, Mitch and their presentation tonight. It's wonderful to see faces in the audience. Um, and so.